G'day fans and welcome back to another exciting episode of Nerdy Things from Another World. Yes, it's that fantastic podcast where we focus on sci-fi movies, TV shows and a bit of the old Australian sci-fi fandom. I'm your host, Dags, and did you know my co-host is just so cool that during the filming of a pivotal scene in a fan film where we had to drive and recite dialogue, he actually drove up a dead-end street ruining what was a fantastic take Whilst lamenting, it's hard to talk and then drive at the same time. Yes, it's Jeff. <laughs> dags, dags, you're going to be writing my autobiography, you know, sort of, uh, you're going to be my ghostwriter. You remember more about things about me than I remember things about me. <laughs> Did you, do you remember that at all? <laughs> I do, yes. And, uh, it all gets cleaned up in the editing, a bit like this uh, audio <laughs> podcast. It? And it is a true story. It was a fantastic take in this fan film. And then Jeffro decided to take a right-hand turn up a dead-end street. And we're going, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> You're not supposed to turn up, are you? Oh, you got to laugh. But, uh, yes, it was all fixed in post. The world is uh, very, very cool. But it's very funny. We were talking about uh, fan films. And that should actually lead into uh, what should be uh, a letter of comment covering such a topic. So what letter of comment have we received here, Jeffro? And who's it from? Yes, we have a wonderful letter from our international listener. He comes from Greece. Now, uh, his name is uh, Mykonos J. Fokalopolopoulos. <laughs> And <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez! I tell you what. And uh, he says, "Dear nerds, what are the pros and cons to making fan films?" Well, that's a very good question, and we'll have some very good answers. Fingers crossed. Now, just to clarify, first off, fan films are not movies about cooling appliances. Just that I'd want to clarify that. A lot of people think that's what fan films are. It is a bit of a stupid title when you think about it, but uh, yeah, it's not about that. Uh, they're actually independent movies based uh, on an existing franchise, and of course, they're done for the love of it, not for the money. So Jeffro and I have made and been in numerous fan films in uh, our journey, so we know exactly what it's all about in terms of actually making them and being in them. Pros and cons. Uh, well, I guess the first pro is that you get to be in a film for a franchise you love. And a con, of course, is the fact you don't get any money from it. But uh, what are your thoughts on the whole thing of pros and cons of fan films, Jeffro? Certainly one of the cons is the, the money side of things. Now, I know that I deliberately made mine things on the cheap. And the gag was that, you know, it looks so bad that people could laugh at it. Whereas you are on the opposite spectrum. You actually had uh, some quite considerably decent good equipment uh, and uh, and did it right. So I know that uh, yours was certainly more costly than any of the, the ones that I did. Yeah, so just to clarify, uh, so the films that you made uh, all made primarily in the 1990s. So you had uh, the first one was Ghost Bastards, uh, which you can find on YouTube if you want to check that out. Shakespeare Wars was the second one. Uh, and then you did a sock puppet version of Star Wars called Sock Wars, and that was, I think, probably in the early 2000s. And then you had uh, that two to three minute thing called Pee Wee Monster, uh, which you and I worked on and we have discussed previously. So, um, yeah, you've sort of covered off a fair bit of uh, territory in your time. Uh, for myself, I worked on three, but only two of them got completed. So the big Star Wars one that I worked on was Jedi Heritage, which you can find on YouTube if you want to check that out. I was the director of that and uh, it was all involved a large group of the uh, Star Wars fan club. I also did a, uh, a promotional movie for the Star Wars fan club called Skyforce the Movie. And the one that never got completed was called Disturbance in the Force, which was a bit of a largest production in the early 2000s. And unfortunately, it never got finished. So, uh, and aside from that, of course, we've appeared in them uh, in various guises, whether it be sort of uh, on camera, under masks, or sort of I've played numerous dead bodies and whatever else. But uh, that's probably the bulk of it. And, of course, both of us appeared in uh, a fan film called Seventh Victim, which was uh, made in, um, by our good friend Russell Devlin, who keeps popping up on this show. And that was the uh, fan film we were referring to earlier when uh, Jeffro was driving down the street and uh, got his lines all mixed up. But, uh, yeah, so fan films themselves have evolved since, the like, the 1990s. It was such a new concept. People could just sort of, like... And especially from the Star Wars point of view, just get some sticks, jump out in the backyard and just whack the crap out of each other, turn sticks into lightsabers and bang, there was your fan film. But these days, um, unfortunately, the quality now needs to be really, really high, almost pseudo-professional, just to ensure an audience. So from your point of view, you would have seen a massive shift in how 
the fan film concept has changed in the past 25 to 30 years, yeah? Certainly when it comes to the CG work, whenever you saw something that was CG related in the uh, early 90s films, you were just gobsmacked that someone actually could create that. And now I guess with technology on PCs and all that, it's becoming sort of almost expected. But at the time, people just go, wow, how did that person do that? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. I mean, I guess what kind of helped uh, in the 1990s in particular is that uh, software programs for creating visual effects became more commonplace for computers, and that allowed people to do things like spaceship effects and lightsabers and whatever. There were entire tutorials on how to do lightsabers back in the day. Now it's all like commonplace, but back then it was really cutting edge. So I look at it from the point of view of saying between 1997 and 2005, Star Wars was really, really prominent. There were Star Wars fans films everywhere or from all around the world. And most of them, funnily enough, some of the better ones actually came from Melbourne in, uh, in Australia. There's a whole lot that got produced in the city. Uh, and, of course, from the early 2000s right up until not that long ago, Star Trek uh, had its big range of fan films being produced. And some of those, uh, all American, uh, the quality of those was so high that uh, even some of the actors who actually worked on the real TV shows got involved with some of these fan films. So the whole fan film um uh, concept has changed considerably over that period of time where you are right it's become a bit of a pseudo professional thing now well certainly when um people were doing um star wars fan films they actually had a, a website called the force.net and you could literally visit there and watch dozens of different uh, uh fan films and one of them in particular uh, has since become very famous and that was called troops and the gentleman that made that is almost like found himself edging into the uh, film industry because I think he's done uh, a few documentaries and a, a few films because that's what got him in the uh, his foot in the door. Well, that's true. So there are some that um, became sort of infamous over the journey and Troops was definitely uh, one of them. Um, so you mentioned the Force.net. The funny thing about the Force.net, now this is obviously before YouTube came into being, um, they would uh, host uh, Star Wars fan films on their site and everybody went there to look for these movies. The problem was that they had so many uh, applications that they actually had an approval process and it was if your film did not get approval and as a consequence did not get hosted by the force.net, it was the equivalent of being like chucked out in the recycling bin because nobody would see it anywhere else. So if it got hosting on the force.net, it was the equivalent of saying, oh, my God, we've just made the big time and every Star Wars fan is going to watch it. So that's how uh, how famous that uh, site was. And it was the go to place for Star Wars fan films for a long time. I remember being avid about watching uh, Star Wars fan movies. So uh, the trailers, the, the movies themselves, I, I, I watched them all. I had a huge appetite for these things because I just love them so much. Look, from the Australian perspective, I mean, there was one that was being made in Sydney. It was called The Dark Redemption. That was in the late 1990s. And that actually was probably the first fan film to use an actor from the movies. And uh, that was um, Peter Sumner. The thing about the Dark Redemption is they were actually filmed on the Fox studio, so they actually built whole sets and everything and used characters from the books and whatever else. And it was a really, really high-end production. It did really well for itself, so well, in fact, that Lucasfilm got wind of it and were a bit miffed about what they were doing. So I think they got sent cease and desist letters and whatever else. So there are examples, and there has been cases, where some fan films have become so popular that it's actually caused them a bit of grief with the, uh, the licensee holders uh, from the Star Trek side, I mean, there was a huge furor about five or six years ago with a uh, fan film called um, Prelude to Axanar that did a Kickstarter campaign and ended up raising on like $100,000, which uh, naturally Paramount weren't entirely happy with, and there's a long story as to what happened regarding all that. So, uh, yeah, there is a scenario where some of the fan films, especially in modern times, have been able to raise funds and, of course, try to uh, emulate the real movies or TV shows as much as possible, which kind of works and looks really, really good to a large degree. The thing that kind of lets them down sometimes is the acting. And one of the things that uh, I learned from my productions is that sometimes it's easier to get professional actors and just teach them, you know, what a communicator is or a transporter or a lightsaber or a Jedi rather than, use, than using fans who, you know, who might know the material but can't act. And as a consequence, if uh, a lot of fan films can look a tad cheap because they've used um, sort of amateur actors. So if you can get professional actors, 
that is usually the way to go because you get just you just get a better quality product. And the other thing about professional actors is you know they're going to turn up because I know that when I made Ghost Bastards, we had all the uh, the friends uh, there and some of them had things they had to attend to, so we didn't always get uh, all the people there, so we delayed it. And the whole process, I remember uh, making a comment in the actual uh, film itself, is that uh, it took a year from uh, start to finish because just trying to tee everyone up was just a nightmare. Yeah, that's true. Um, another thing too, it's interesting, like back in our day, costumes are always really, really difficult to get, uh, especially good looking ones. Now, of course, costume has, uh, is like it become this massive industry and it's almost like that's the one thing you won't have a problem with. So if you're doing Star Wars, Star Trek, superhero movies, I mean, every man these dog's got a costume of some description uh, and that can look really, really cool. So at least that part of it will look very, very groovy. Your visual effects will look really, really groovy. It all comes down to your quality of your story and the production values. And as we mentioned, um, there's a fair bit of money being poured into these things now. I remember of a, a fan film once, this is back in the early 2000s, that was actually shot on 16 millimeter film which was just completely insane. It was just going to get an online internet release. You know, you could hear budgets of $20,000 and $30,000 and all sort of thing, remembering that with a fan film, it can't be sold. You cannot make money off it. If you do that, you're breaking the law. So you're doing it for the fun of it. There were ex examples of superhero ones, though, that had a fair bit of money poured in them. Um, do you remember a movie called Batman Dead End? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, it was made by the guy who designed the Jurassic Park logo, and he did it intentionally as a uh, show reel for his work. And it's absolutely famous as one of the best Batman uh, fan films you'll ever see. And that cost him thirty thousand dollars, but he had a uh, he was a professional guy, and he was doing it for uh, a certain reason. And then there was another one called World's Finest, which came out, which was about Batman and Superman together. I actually saw that the trailer for that because it was just a trailer; there was no movie. Uh, the day before I started shooting, the first day of Jedi Heritage, and I was so depressed. I looked at World's Finest. I go, mate, why am I even bothering? This is way cooler than anything I could do. <laughs> well, I know I was working at the opposite end of the spectrum. So just to give you a bit of an idea, when we did uh, Ghost Bastards, the backpacks were generally vacuum cleaners. The, uh, the signage on the uh, side of the door was me colouring in a uh, Ghost Bastards logo and sticking on the side of a car with blue tack. Uh, I also remember we had a, uh, a toy Godzilla that was a, uh, a monster. And for the Marshmallow Man, I actually got marshmallows, stuck them on a, a, a wire shape of a, um, a figure, and then uh, that was my uh, Marshmallow Man. And it worked really, really well because that allowed for uh, one of the uh, actors to pull uh, off a piece of marshmallow while the marshmallow man is talking and, <laughs> and actually eat it, which I thought was really, really cool. Um, from a live action perspective there, there's a lot going on now. Now, of course, if people were going to say, oh, I wanna really want to make a fan film, uh, it's a big ask now. There's a lot of time and effort involved. As I said, if you make something that's really cheap and nasty, it may not even get an audience because people just won't watch it. But that doesn't mean you can't think outside the box and do something differently. So uh, it's kind of funny. We keep making references to our good buddy, Russell Devlin, who made that uh, fan film Seven Victim that you and I were both in. Uh, that was in the mid-2000s. So Russell, in the past like decade, what he's been doing to keep his costs down and make his life a little easier, he's actually been doing animated fan films. So he's been taking uh, images from comic pages and animating the images within those. And he's either using re-recorded audio with new actors or audio recorded from radio plays and storybooks, and he's putting the images on top of that. It's very, very clever, and it works really, really well. It's not high-end, like CG animation or anything like that. It's relatively basic, but the story works, and the principle works. And uh, he actually calls it devlimation, which I think is actually quite neat. So for people out there who think, oh, yeah, actually making live-action fan films is a little bit too difficult, animation is uh, one option you can certainly consider. In this day and age when fandom by its very nature is not something where people socially get together it is very hard to get a group of people to do things these days so by doing stuff either on your computer or what have you seems to be the uh, the norm i think you mentioned earlier about getting hold of people to help you out and i was kind of lucky with our uh, the ones i did because uh, being part of the Star Wars fan club, there was an army of people all ready to jump on board to help out. So if you were by yourself and you go, oh, I want to make a fan film, where do I turn? That can be quite difficult uh, if you've got no connections. I had everything. I had the crew, the cast, the whole lot. 
and it was really good. What happens is you end up with people who say, I just want to be involved. Um, I'll be on the set. I'm happy to carry the coffees around. And you go, I don't need six people carrying coffees. That's how bad it was. So when we were doing Jedi Heritage, I think we ended up with a crew of 23 people at one point. It was just madness. So what do you reckon your final thoughts on the old fan film experience there, Jeffro? Well, I love the fact that there are also time capsules because uh, we can go back and look at what fun we were having 35, 40 years ago. And uh, also, uh, I just have to say, my kid has seen my uh, fan films and he thinks they're pretty cool. So that gives me a real glowing feeling that uh, it's like sort of uh, these things still get enjoyed. I love it. You would have said to him, what do you think of that? Did you did you like it? Did you like it? And he just says, uh, yeah, it was really cool, Dad. Well done. And he goes, excellent. <laughs> There's a lot more we could discuss, especially Aaron Volman. There's a, actually a hell of a lot when you sit and think about it. Um, but we haven't got time to do that because we've got to move on to other things. So who do we have to thank for that fantastic letter of comment there, Jeffro? That letter was done by uh, Michalopoulos J. Foxolopoulos. Oh, my God, that's just unbelievable. Again, have all these great people writing in going, we don't sound like that. Our names aren't like that at all. But uh, that's absolutely fantastic, which is really, really cool. Now it's actually time for us to move on to our main topic, which happens to be, what are we discussing tonight, Mr. Jeffro? We're going to talk about the small screen experience. We're going to talk about shows that we think are great sci-fi TV shows. And, my goodness, there is decades and decades of TV shows to pick. So if we don't uh, mention any that you really love, I quite understand because it's so hard to actually uh, narrow them down. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to talk with the obvious ones, your Doctor Who and your Star Trek and whatever else. And it's like, yeah, we could just talk for hours on all those sort of things because they're big, they're famous, and they've been around for decades. So how about we focus on some of the other things that have come out uh, in, in our time things that uh, may have been forgotten, sort of may or not have left a legacy, and other things that have left a legacy. So what springs to mind for you, old Jeffro? I mean, you were much more of a sci-fi TV watcher than I was, so uh, what do you uh, want to cover off uh, on this particular evening? Well, I remember watching a lot of shows that were played in the reruns, and uh, that was my first experience of science fiction. So uh, one of the... Um, the shows that I absolutely loved, and I, I was just thinking the other day, I can tell I loved a show because I could recite the lyrics in, in the uh, song or the narration in the opening credits. And uh, one of those prime examples for me was the 1950s Superman TV show. God, that's going right back, isn't it, eh? So, but you are right. A lot of people grew up on Superman, the TV series, the George Reeves one. And it was one of those shows that uh, the characters were just so enjoyable to watch. I mean, they were very much like the cartoons coming to life. And uh, as I said, it was, it's one of those ones that it just lived on for so many decades after it was made because it's a universal theme. It's, it's Superman. It doesn't really date too much other than the fact that uh, the costumes that they're wearing are from sort of the period. Yeah, yep, totally agree with you too. Um, so uh, I guess now you started watching TV shows primarily in the 1970s, so you're a bit of a, you know, from your Thunderbirds and your Space 1999s and uh, shows of that era. What of the 1970s sort of strikes you as being the stuff that uh, has stuck in your mind since then? One of the uh, the main ones, and this is interesting because I've got the complete set of bubblegum cards, I've got the, uh, the novelizations, I've got the annuals and all that, and this was the Planet of the Apes television show. I really loved it. And, I mean, I'd seen the movies, but as, as a kid, the television show was really geared towards sort of uh, providing that Planet of the Apes experience every week. And it had Roddy McDowell and, uh, and the other uh, actors in it just really uh, made the show a fun experience to, uh, to watch. And uh, it is one of those shows that... Uh, anyone that saw it at the time will fondly remember it, but uh, maybe not quite so after that because it didn't really get too much uh, airtime in the 80s or 90s. Planet of the Apes, the TV series, you are right. That's one that most people won't have heard of. Uh, so Roddy McDowell was in it. What was the character he played? Do you remember? Uh, oh, gosh, you got me on that one. I'm just trying to think. Um, damn you. Damn, um, damn. It was... <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, I, I will remember. I'll remember it. 
I will remember it half an hour later when I'm not thinking. Well, you won't have to remember it half an hour later because I'm going to tell you the answer was Galen. So, uh, there you Galen, go. that's <laughs> it. Because so, you're a nerd. Yeah, you're exactly right. Yes. Absolutely fantastic. But it all started. Yeah, he actually had shows back in the '60s as well, didn't you? Because um, I know if there were things like your uh, your invaders and your favourite Martians of the world. So just winding the decade back even earlier, and of course that includes things like your Outer Limits, which of course was the like the if you want the follow up series to the Twilight Zone, because there's been multiple Twilight Zones. But I think you can you can't knock the original, the old Rod Serling version. So going from the fifties and the sixties, old son, what, what uh, sticks out there for you? Well, certainly I remember the Outer Limits because it was a show that I'd read so much about. And I so desperately wanted to see it. And I didn't actually get to see it until the 1980s when there was a consortium of us fans that actually imported the tapes from uh, uh, America. And at the time, there was one episode on one tape. So we had to import it to Australia. Then we actually had to spend money to get it converted. And then after that, once it was converted, we all got a copy. And uh, But once I did get to see it, I could see what all the fuss was about because, as I said, I'd been hearing about it for such a long time. And there were so many shows that sort of also fit that uh, description. I remember um, the UK show The Prisoner. Uh, I'd read the books, I'd read the annuals, uh, but it was not until uh, someone was able to import videotapes in that I was actually able to see it for myself. Very, very cool. And, of course, I know um, Space 1990, we sort of covered this off before you joined the fan club uh, for that back in the 1970s. So how big was Space 1999 really when it came to the impact in the whole sci-fi genre? Now, you've got to remember, after Star Trek, there was not really anything that came out. So there was a group of fans that were just looking for something to be able to latch on to. And this came out in 74. And this is where uh, myself and so many other people just said, this is, this is what we were looking for. This is, this is our holy grail of, of, of science fiction um, that we would like to, uh, you know, bow down and worship. And, uh, and it wasn't until 77 when the Star Wars movie came out that uh, the younger fans that couldn't appreciate Space 1999 did get their uh, opportunity to then sort of, you know, come out of the closet in terms of science fiction and and worship uh, Star Wars. But, but as I said, uh, for the older um, people like me, as I said, it was it was a relevation because it was the, the the effects were amazing, the stories. There's such a huge budget on it. The actors, I mean, it had Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, and a whole bunch of other different uh, actors that uh, we all already knew. So Space 1999 still is very much an amazing community. If you have a look on the uh, Facebook page, there's literally tens of thousands of uh, followers of its page, and they're still producing merchandise. I mean, there's books. There's an upcoming documentary about the Eagles. There's toys still being released. There's action figures. It's, it's just like for the people that are uninitiated, they would not even realize how big it, it still is right now. That is very, very cool. I was trying to think of what shows I would have watched in the 70s, and there were a few that came and went relatively quickly. I remember things like Fantastic Journey really working for me. I haven't seen it since the 1970s. If I was to watch it today, I'd probably think, oh, my God, that's terrible. But at the time, it was, like, absolutely awesome. Logan's Run, of course, was made as a TV series as well in the 70s. Mm. Uh, that was only short-lived, if I recall, only about maybe 10 or 12 episodes. Is that right? Yeah, it was short-lived, but that's another one that uh, I absolutely uh, loved. Um, Gregory Harrison, uh, Donald Moffat, um, as it, it was just a great cast. Um, alongside that, you did have the bigger ones like your Battlestar Galacticas and Buck Rogers. I think everybody loved Buck Rogers. And, of course, here in Australia, we've got released as a feature film. Um, and I guess... A lot of people dialed into TV in the sort of the mid to late seventies, and as you said, the post Star Wars era, there was a lot more of these things coming out. So, and of course, you haven't mentioned UFO. I'm surprised you didn't bring that one up from the early seventies. Well, UFO was a bit of a uh, a tricky one because I didn't really sort of see it until uh, much later. Because I think sort of uh, when it was showing originally, I was too young, and it took a long time for the repeats to sort of be shown here in Australia. So. Uh, it, uh, it is a show that I enjoy, but I know it's got many fans. 
And the late 70s got to see uh, on the other side of the Atlantic uh, from the BBC side as well, um, of course, Blake 7, which most people probably haven't even heard of, but at the time had a massive fan base. And uh, you, of course, were part of that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember the fan clubs, the fanzines, where you'd write fan fiction, and it and it really is a case of not many people do remember it now. You have to be of a certain vintage. And again, I think it's because if a show doesn't really get rerun, it tends to get forgotten very quickly. And I don't recall Blake 7 after about 1981, 1982 uh, ever being broadcast on uh, Australian television. And it wasn't until sort of the the uh, videotapes came out and are laid across the DVDs that it gave people a chance to actually be able to uh, see it, but only if they wanted to buy it. I actually never watched it myself, but I did know that there was a fan base for it, which was good to see. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, like three, four decades later, it's probably just disappeared into the midst. Um, for myself, um, it's interesting because I'm more of a fan of shows that don't last long. I'm not a big fan of like series that go forever. I mean, Stargate, for example, went for 11 seasons. I didn't watch a single episode of that. Uh, I, know, I liked the movie. I thought that was really, really good. Same with Alien Nation uh, when they came out in the 80s. Loved the movie. Never watched the TV series. I found that committing to a TV series was usually quite difficult, and I wasn't really prepared to do that. But, I mean, there are some examples of shows that have come out uh, that uh, left a lasting impression. From the 80s, I guess the biggest thing that uh, I really dialed into was V, the miniseries. You had the final battle, and then you had the actual the weekly series that was produced afterwards in the mid-80s, and that was absolutely horrendous, so you could just forget that. But the miniseries and the final battle were really good, and even today have left a lasting legacy with a lot of people. So um, when it comes to 80s TV, they're definitely, that's definitely something that uh, rates really highly in my book. I mean, certainly the short-lived shows, I think, are the ones that tend to find the greatest cult following and probably the best example, and everyone will go, yes, of course, uh, is Firefly. I mean, it was cut short in its prime. And, I mean, they did make a, a movie afterwards, but certainly one of the greatest uh, sci-fi shows that you'd ever want to see. Uh, another one that we could look at would be Space Above and Beyond. That came out in the 90s. And for those people that saw it and, and had a chance to see it, I mean, it certainly... Uh, ranks amongst my you know top 20 and there's other uh shows like um uh, earth 2 and if i mention that there's probably one percent of the audience that actually go oh yes i remember earth 2 but uh, it's it's a great science fiction show and uh, i said it just deserved a better audience but uh, it was short-lived and uh, never really got into the repeats as we mentioned with like Blake 7, you could actually argue that Firefly was a, uh, a remake to a degree of Blake 7 because some of the concepts were exactly the same. Uh, I actually never watched Firefly until about a couple of years ago because I remember all the hype when it came out and the fact that it got cancelled really, really early just didn't seem to make any sense at all from a production point of view as to why you would do that. But uh, sometimes it has been argued that shows that sort of get cut off at their prime will actually have a longer lifespan with the uh, fans because of what happened to it. I mean, for all we know, had Firefly continued on for year after year after year, it could have done an X-Files and eventually sort of like like petered out. So maybe being short-lived would actually worked in its favour. Um, another series that I really liked, and I really dialed into this one, I know a lot of people didn't at the time, um, and it only had five seasons and all five of them were fantastic, was the reimagined Battlestar Galactica. Absolutely divided the fan base because you had the traditionalists versus the new people. But in terms of adult TV, that really worked for me. And I find that uh, as a sci-fi fan, I like my series to be very adult orientated, to have the children's stuff removed and to be a bit more um, intense and dramatic. And Battlestar Galactica, the reimagined series, was definitely that. Definitely a show not for kids. It was very hard-hitting drama and that really pushed my buttons and uh how did you find battlestar when it came out i tried to get into it and i guess if i gave it more of a chance i'd probably enjoy it uh, i mean i didn't dismiss it to say oh this is rubbish but it it took a little bit me for trying to get into it because it, it just didn't grab me straight away but there's a there's a lot of shows that are very serious in their uh, science fiction these days i mean i'm looking at uh, 
uh, things like uh, Foundation, and uh, there's another one called uh, I think it's called Counterpoint, where it's like it's different uh, different mirror dimensions. And Altered Carbon, of course, which uh, is very much a serious television show that um, had a very short run. I mentioned Battlestar Galactica a moment ago. One of the things that I did love about Battlestar is the prequel series to it, which most people never saw, and it was called Caprica. And, of course, Caprica was set about 40, 50 years before Battlestar, the reimagined series, and it's hardly a sci-fi show at all. It's all set on Caprica. There's hardly any spaceships. There's like no like ray guns and all this sort of business. It's very much down to earth uh, drama, and I absolutely loved Caprica. And I know a lot of people didn't dial into it. It only went for one season, but if you're a Battlestar fan, as a prequel, it was outstandingly good. I really loved it. I don't know if you ever saw it at all, or uh, have any thoughts on that. I didn't actually see it, and I just didn't see anything that I I felt was worth spending my time to uh, to get into it. So no. Nah. Never saw it. That's fair enough. And with Foundation, the funny thing about Foundation, uh, and I've said this to a few people before, so effectively you get big books that get transferred into films or TV series. And, of course, Dune has been made three times now. So you had the 84 version, the 2001 miniseries, and, of course, you've got the current Dune movies. But Foundation, this is the first time it's ever been produced for the screen. So I've actually said to a few of my friends, saying of the two shows worth watching, foundation is the one you must check out because there's never been an on-screen version of it before and if you are i guess if you're one of those people who's a huge fan of the books you might go oh, it kind of doesn't work for you but if you're familiar with the books just the name and the concept foundation is a series i would definitely recommend it and uh, i reckon that's definitely one that is really going places which is uh, very very cool um another series which is also because once again sticking for the adult theme uh definitely not for children underline the not um, considering that the original movie, which was made in the 70s, was a little bit of a PG film, uh, the TV series Westworld. The violence, the nudity, the story will absolutely bust your brain. And I tell you what, if you like watch one episode a week, you'll never get on top of it. It is hard work. But, geez, I tell you what, all power to them for breaking all the... Um, uh, the rules for TV shows. How did you find that, old son? Wasn't that something that would tease your brain? I agree. It was a bit of a hard slog, and particularly when you got to the third series, you really had to have your head in the game because it was all changing around. And And I think the only reason why it wasn't uh, renewed is because it was such an expensive television show to make that uh, they just felt that they couldn't justify uh, spending that kind of money to continue it on, which is a shame because... It, it had so much going for it. Yeah, if you like fluffy TV shows where you can just switch your brain off and just watch all the excitement, don't watch Westworld. It is really hard work uh, and you've got to concentrate because there's a lot going on. Um, just uh, a couple of others that I want to chuck in before I sort of finish my part of the conversation. I got talked into watching a series called The Expanse. Um, loved it. And the idea of The Expanse is that the entire solar system has been colonised and, of course, it's this big political machinations between people on Earth, people on Mars, and those who live out near um, the asteroid belts in near Jupiter. Absolutely love it. And, of course, they discover alien life, and there's a whole side regarding that. So if you haven't seen The Expanse, I reckon that is definitely one worth checking out. A lot of people dialed into the Orville. Uh, back at the time, it came out when the Star Trek Discovery was coming out, and people said at the time, oh, that's what Star Trek should have looked like. There's only been three seasons, I think, of or, uh, Orville. It's... Yeah, excellent. Really, really good series. Really well done and uh, definitely well worth checking out if you haven't done so already. And just finally for myself, one series I did love, even though the purists hated it with a passion, was Halo. Loved the Halo series. It was awesome. Don't care about the games. Don't care if it matches the story or whatever else. The production design of Halo was spectacular. You always wanted to see Master Chief slicing and dicing the Covenant. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, I've got to admit that one really pushed my buttons. Yeah, and if that's not working for you, go and check out a series called Silo, which only just recently finished its first season. Really, really good stuff. Now, as soon as you said you liked uh, Battlestar Galactica, the first thing I thought was, I bet Dags also liked The Expanse. And there you go, actually, uh, you proved the point. I mean, I enjoy sort of uh, a little bit on the opposite end. So there's a lot of uh, kids' shows that I really enjoy. Uh, one of them is Jerry Anderson's Terrorhawks. Now, at the time, it was a bit pilloried, but it's uh, now actually uh, officially 40 years old this year. 
and uh, and it's got a really nice fan base and and the stories don't take themselves so seriously uh on the side of cartoons robotech was a huge one for me that uh, actually was mind-blowing because it actually just had such a saga to it it's almost like star blazers or space cruiser yamato it just had so much going on and uh, i really enjoyed that and also uh, in the 60s i liked a lot of the Irwin allen shows can't go past things like land of the giants voyage to the bottom of the seat lost in space i mean so much goodness and uh, from the 60s there and i guess uh, the other one i really want to mention and it's sort of uh, uh, one that uh, is revered, I guess, for want of a better word, is is Clone Wars, the old Star Wars Clone Wars. How good was that? I mean, this is this is seriously good writing in an animated series. This is almost the sort of writing that some of the uh, fans say, why can't the live action versions write this good? I mean, uh, Star Wars Clone Wars was just so good to watch. Uh, it's very funny because sticking with the animated side of things, um, I was always a big fan of Battle of the Planets, which came out in the 70s, which uh, a lot of people will know if you're in Japan. It's called Gatchaman. And just recently, uh, I only watched uh, segments of this, but I did actually quite like it. It was all good old Rick and Morty. I thought that was actually very, very clever, the way that show was put together, a nice little bit of uh, humour for your sci-fi, if that is your go. There is a lot to check out there, Jeffro. And the one thing we haven't covered off, and there will be people screaming at their speakers right now, why didn't we say Babylon 5? Yes, everybody loves Babylon 5. It's, it's in two camps. People who have watched it and love it, and those who have never seen it and have no intentions of seeing it. But uh, Babylon 5 definitely has its place in many people's hearts as well as it should. And, of course, it was released in the 1990s. There's just so much good stuff out there. And, I mean, we just don't have the time. But uh, I'd love to sort of see uh, all the comments that uh, people will comment about, oh, this is my favourite show. And, and we'll go, yes, it was ours. We just ran out of time. So, so many, uh, so many good uh, shows to... Uh, to choose and just not the time to do it yeah and they're still producing good material too which is the most important thing which is absolutely fantastic so, so what do you reckon should we sign off for this evening yes it's been a great discussion i've really enjoyed it and i hope other people have as well so uh, let's hope that they got in the zone when they were listening to this absolutely fantastic and as always as you go off and hit the tv remote button make sure you <gasps> stay nerdy see you later Da 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 da